Intonation can be used to direct the listener's attention to a particular part of the message. The, me the part of the message that you as the speaker want to be the most salient, the most kind of, to stand out the most. Um, if we, I like to think about it, this as like, if you were taking a photograph with a camera, I mean, I've seen lots of photographs being taken through Skep already, so I'm sure you're all familiar. Um, when you take a photograph of something, the camera will focus in on one part of the picture. And just as we can choose to focus in on different things within a picture when we take a photograph, so we can choose to focus in on different parts of a, a message when we speak an utterance. So we're going to look at the focusing function of intonation. Tonicity is in particularly important here. Where you place the nuclear tone is crucial. For where you focus your hearer's attention. So grammatical function, focusing function. The third function that I'm going to introduce today, and I think Tim is going to continue with uh, in the following lectures, is what we're going to call the attitudinal or affective function of intonation. This is where the intonation pattern that you use helps to communicate the speaker's attitude. Now that might be their attitude to what they are saying, and it might also be their attitude to the person they're speaking to. So you can convey your emotions. You can use intonation to show that you're shocked, or surprised, or bored, or interested, or skeptical, or any range of emotions. The tone that you choose is crucial here, critical to this function. So those are our three functions functional categories that we're going to look at. Uh, grammatical function, focusing function, and the attitudinal function. We're going to see how they interact with tone, tonality, and tonicity. Okay, so, going back to the first one of those, the grammatical function. And how the grammatical function uh, can be determined by our use of tone, the tone that we select. So a very simple example to start with. And I'm sure one that you're all familiar with. A rising tone can be used to indicate that something is a question, that it's interrogative. So some examples, you can follow these in the hand if you like. So examples in one and two. We take these two words, new and car, but we put a rising tone on the nucleus. We turn two words into a question, new car. Have you got a new car? Is that a new car? Do you want a new car? Who knows? We need to know more about the context to know but we know that there's something questioning, something interrogative going on there. Or, similarly, we can just take one word and using a rising tone on that, make it become a question. So this is a very useful uh, utterance to practice for the end of Skep Party on Friday, where you just say, drink. And you're offering somebody a drink, asking if they want to drink. So, very simple. The tone can change a statement into a question. So it has an effect on the grammatical role that the utterance is playing in the message. It is, it is however, important to be aware that not all rising tones equal questions, and not all questions need rising tones. Unfortunately, intonation doesn't line up with really nice hard and fast rules in a way we might perhaps like to do it. So in these examples, yes, fine, you can turn a statement into a question, but you don't always have to have a rising intonation. So when a question is indicated, when the fact that you are asking a question is indicated by the syntax, so when you're using a, a WH word, what, how, where, why, when, who, you wouldn't normally have a rising tone. You don't need that rising tone as well. So where do you live? still a perfectly fine question without necessarily needing that rising tone. So unfortunately, what we're giving you today is, is general, some generalisations, not necessarily hard and fast rules. So that's the grammatical function and tone. Tonicity also plays, uh, also has a, can play an important grammatical role. It can tell us what grammatical role a particular word or phrase is playing within the sentence. So it can tell us whether something is a noun or a verb or, uh, or, or, or what, what function it's performing. So I'm going to give you some examples of that. So um, how many of you flew on an aeroplane to get to Skep? 
most of you, most of you, some, some hands, some of you had a very, very long walk if you did in that case. But I think most of you probably have, have, have not a lot of you have flown in the last couple of weeks. When you did that, when you got on the plane, you were probably told, as you were saying, you were probably told to prepare for takeoff. These two words here, take and off, functioning as a noun here. And we know that partly because we've got the, uh, the nucleus on the first word, take off. Prepare for take off. Functioning as a noun. Now compare that with perhaps if you came through particularly um, strict security, you may have been asked to take off your shoes. To take off your shoes. Same two words. You move the stress pattern and you turn a noun into a verb. This is a very kind of, uh, in, in English there are many words that can function as both nouns and verbs and this is a very productive rule that we have here. So I'll give you um, some more examples. And this example is just, it's two words, but it can also, this pattern also follows within a word itself. So uh, if you look at this picture here, these are things that when I was 12 or 13, I used to go and spend my pocket money on at the weekend. And they are called records, I don't think they exist anymore, but they are records with the uh, accent, with the um, to uh, tonic on the first syllable, records. Compare that with the same word used as a verb, and we have the same pattern. This machine here records things, records things, records and records. I know, um, I think Michael and Jeff have mentioned these examples already, but we can see that also fitting into this pattern of tonicity playing a grammatical role. Um, one more example of this. So this is a, um, this is a permit. This permit permits you to fish at a certain place in a certain time. The permit now permits you to do that. Same pattern, turning a noun into a verb, a verb into a noun, using the intonation pattern. It's grammatical function and tonicity. Um, yes. I was just trying to understand the difference between tonicity and tonality because in the dictionary, tonicity is physical ten tensions. The translation is. Okay, so what, what we, we, we're using it here to say tonality is the um, breaking things up into IP units. Mm -hmm. So how you chunk things together, which we'll come on to in a moment. Tonicity is where you place the tonic, where you place the nuclear tone. So you've got an IP, where within that IP are you going to place the nucleus? Okay. okay? So we'll come on to that in a moment. I mean, the, the terminology, you know, if you understand what's going on, that's more important than necessarily knowing the terminology. I'll give you another example. And this is a picture here of a bird. Yeah, a bird. And this bird is black. And we want to describe this bird using these two words. What's it going to sound like, do you think? want to give a guess. Blackbird. Is this a blackbird? Oh, no. Ah. <laughs> We're going to see a blackbird in a moment. If we think of it as, what we have here is we have an adjective and we have a noun. So it's going to function like any other adjective noun phrase. So if I were to say, sunny day, or interesting lecture, or um, uh, so, uh, yeah, like that. We've, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna end up. We're not gonna say blackbird. We're gonna say black, blackbird, right? Blackbird. Sunny day. Interesting lecture. A beautiful city. Kind of thing. Okay. We're gonna put that accent on the noun, which is gonna be the last content word. That's where we're used to putting the nucleus when we put two words together. So if we describe this, which is actually some kind of buzzard or eagle, I think, I don't know. Um, using these two words, we're going to say black bird, black bird. This, however, is, what, what's this, anyone know? Bird lovers? This is a black bird. The name of the species of this bird is black bird. Now, it's actually, you'll notice, it's actually brown. <laughs> Female blackbirds are not black, but they're still black birds. So, this was a black bird, and this is a black bird. Here we're making the difference between an adjective, a noun phrase, and a compound. Again, I know Michael and Jeff have talked about compounds before. And this, again, is a very productive pattern in English. 
because I think Michael said, or somebody said the other day, can't go one of the sentences without coming across a compound in English. So here's some other examples. Um, what's this a picture of? It's the White House. It's the White House. Now the White House would be the White House, even if you painted it blue with purple spots, it would still be the White House. It is white, but so is this. This is what? Is this? White House. It's not the White House. to uh, 
um, the use of uh, relative clauses. So I'm going to show you some examples of intonation and relative clauses. Relative clauses are clauses which introduce are introduced by a pronoun like who or which, and which add extra information to the sentence. So something like the cat who is sitting on the mat, or the student who got the highest mark. That, that who bit, who got the highest mark, who was sitting on the mat, those are the relative clauses. And they come in two types. First of all, we have what we might what we call a defining relative clause. A defining relative clause gives you crucial information about who the speaker is referring to. So, let me give you an example. This is in 7 and 8 in the handbook. So here we have an example. My cousin who lives in London is a student. My cousin who lives in London is a student. The relative clause here, who lives in London, is telling you which telling you more information about the cousin to help you choose which cousin is being referred to. So my cousin who lives in London, I want you to pick out that cousin. I want you to look at all my cousins and I want you to choose the one who lives in London as the referent for this sentence. My cousin who lives in London is a student, whereas my cousin who lives in Bristol is a dentist. I've got two cousins. One lives in London, one lives in Bristol, one's a student, and one's a dentist. Okay, that's one possible uh, intonation pattern. If, however, we move that relative clause into its own intonational phrase, therefore it gets its own nuclear tone, we get a different interpretation. My cousin, who lives in London, is a student. Now, there is no implication that you have more than one cousin. This is just giving you a piece of information, a bit of extra information about your cousin. It's almost like putting it in brackets. My cousin, who lives in London, in case you're interested, is a student. Different chunking, different tonality, different IP frames uh, breaking up, and we get a slightly different interpretation. Now the relative clause is non-defining, just extra information. So with that in mind, the speaker in mind is providing additional information about one cousin. So with that in mind, if you look at this example, so if someone comes up to you and says, my wife who lives in London, why is this a problem? <laughs> why might this be a problem, at least for most people? Uh, yeah. How many wives? Yes, you're immediately thinking when you're telling me about the wife in, in, in London, but what about the other one? So what we've really got is we've got this kind of scenario. <laughs> one man with two wives, presumably one man, or you know, in this, in this particular representation of that. So that's going to sound very strange. You hear, if, if, you, if you say this, someone's going to think, well, that's very odd. What about your other wife? What, where does she live? Mm -hmm. And that might cause some uh, raised eyebrows. Okay, one last example of tonality performing a um, grammatical function. Tonality can also help us draw a distinction between how adverbials are used. So again, adverbials can come in more than one type. They can be what we call manner adverbials, or they can be sentence adverbials. So let me give you an example to put this into context. In, here, in 11, we have an example where the adverbial amazingly is acting as a um, manner adverbial. My daughter behaved herself amazingly. My daughter behaved herself amazingly. The, the, the word amazingly is telling you about the behaviour. It's modifying the manner in which the behaviour happens. So it's a manner adverbial. Change the intonation pattern to my daughter behaved herself amazingly, and we have a different interpretation. Now, amazingly is modifying the whole sentence. It's got a different IP on its own, it's modifying the whole sentence, and it's saying, my daughter behaved herself, and that is amazing. It's amazing that she managed to behave herself. So from 11 is a compliment to the daughter, she behaved herself amazingly. 12 is a little bit of a backhanded compliment. She behaved herself 
And that in its own right was amazing. Not to be expected. Okay, so we've seen tone, tonicity and tonality all functioning, all contributing to the grammatical function of an utterance. So now I want to move on to that second function, uh, fo the focusing function. And as I said, this is a bit like um, taking a picture and, you're, and you want to focus the camera in on a particular part of the picture. You want to focus the, uh, your hearer's attention in on a particular part of the message. And I thought I wanted to illustrate this using the, the photograph um, analogy. If you get the focus wrong, it can communicate a very different message. So I thought I'd show you a picture where this has kind of happened, but in the photography version instead. So take a look at this picture here, which, oh, thank you. Can you see this picture on the left? So what's happened here is we have two gentlemen on holiday, somewhere beautiful, and they've decided to take a photograph of themselves in this beautiful landscape. And they've set up the camera with a timer, they've focused it probably in on themselves, and they've run to take this picture. And then this little chap has popped up in front, and the camera has focused in on him instead. Now, it's a great picture, it's very cute, it's very sweet. But what's important is it's not what they intended to happen. It's great. Not, it's not the message they intended, it's not the picture they intended. And similarly, if you focus in your reader, your hearer on the wrong part of an utterance, the message that you communicate is going to change, and it might not be what you intended to communicate. So, um, back to the, but the focusing function of intonation, you also sometimes hear it being called the accentual function. English speakers want to focus the hearer onto the most salient, most relevant, most important part of their utterance. Tonicity is crucial to this. So, look at an example. We're going to consider what we're going to call the default pronunciation of sentence. I know Tim might be talking about whether default is in his is the right notion over the next couple of days, but for now we're going to go with it. We have a sentence here. And the default pronunciation of the sentence in 13 would be to place the nucleus on the final content word. So in this sentence, if you can see it on the screen or in your handbooks, it's going to be something like, meet me in front of the pub at 7. Okay. So that is 7, the nucleus, meet me in front of the pub at 7. Okay, now, again, I want you to imagine the scenario. So the lecture's just finished. And everyone's making quite a lot of noise and packing up their bags and make, making their way to their practical classes. And you um, say this to your friend because you want to meet up with them later for a drink and you're going off to different practical classes. So you say this to your friend, meet me in front of the pub at seven. But your friend doesn't quite know if they've heard you correctly, so they repeat it back to you with what they think you've said. So what they repeat back to you is this. So I'll see you in front of the cinema at seven. And you think, they've got this wrong. They're gonna to go to the cinema and I want to meet them in front of the pub. So what you're gonna do when you reply back to them is you're gonna focus their attention on the bit that they've got wrong. So you're gonna be changing the information <coughs> pattern so that they know where they've gone wrong. So rather than having that the uh, tone on seven, it's going to move instead to the bit they got wrong, which is in this case pub. So it'll be no, meet me in front of the pub at seven. Meet me in front of the pub at seven. And you're focusing their attention in. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to have a little go at moving your nucleus around for that focusing function. So what we've got here, this is the original sentence. Meet me in front of the pub at seven. And this is what you hear your friend back say back to you. So I'll see you in the pub at seven. And the second one they might say is, so I'll see Brad in front of the pub at seven. I want you to just spend one minute turning to the person next to you, thinking how you're going to correct these mistakes. Okay, where are you going to move the nucleus to? What's it going to sound like? I'd like you to just have one minute just practicing those, and we'll see if we all come up with the same intonation. One minute, if you go. Here's your more.
how I'm just uh, 15, 16. 16. So I'll see you in the comments. So I'll see you in the Different parts. Yeah. So maybe in the pond, I'm seven. Oh, in the pond. 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 Did that. 
we'll see emerging. And we see, in fact, uh, qualities going across the kind of parentese, motherese speak, across languages across the world. So some things related to language are seem to have universal qualities to them. From a cute little kid to the other end of the scale, I don't know who this lady was. And she's already been mentioned on this course once, so we must be careful. Other prime ministers are available. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so this lady, those you don't know, Margaret Thatcher, she was the prime minister of the UK for far too long. And um, <laughs> she was famous for uh, lots of things, but one of the things she was well, well known about her, and actually if you've seen the film The Iron Lady, she, there's a scene where uh, it just looks at her voice and her use of voice. She attended voice classes. She had a voice tutor in order to help her to lower her voice. We saw from Jeff the other day that she used a lot of low falls. And this was not accidental. This is something she learned to do because lowering your tone is associated with being more in control, more dominant, more powerful. So it's something she learned to do. Kind of a natural the connection there is natural between lower, more controlled, uh, the lower tone and that sense of power and control. And she, and she made that effort to, to kind of play on that natural association that we have. And again, I think this is something that, um, that uh, Tim's going to pick up on and talk about in the next couple of days. But not everything is universal either, and there are some aspects of intonation in English which are language specific but relate to attitudes and emotions. And again, if we get these wrong, that's where we can really start to get problems. So, so all I'm, what I'm going to do now is give some very, very broad generalisations, but there's something to keep in mind. So in English, speaking in a low key, low level tones can indicate a lack of engagement or a lack of interest. So this is something that can cause problems for second language learners if their first language uses more of these kind of tones because you can come across as not as interested as perhaps you are. So, for example, if someone, you know, if a waitress comes up to you in a shop and says, ready to order, without much um, low level tones, I'm not sure I said that correctly, but, <laughs> but it's not going to inspire you to feel really welcome that she's, she or he is really keen on taking your order. Um, I'm going to give a very short anecdote to show how this uh, works in practice, actually, a, a kind of case study of how this can actually, these kind of misunderstandings can have an implication on people's lives. So in the 1970s, um, I'm not sure if it was Gatwick or Heathrow Airport, but there was a problem in the airport amongst the staff between the people who were the women who worked in the canteen, the staff canteen, and the baggage handlers, so the men who dealt with all the baggage. And they reported they didn't like each other. Um, the women, the women in the, uh, who worked in the canteen were mostly Pakistani, and they said that the baggage handlers were racist. And the baggage handlers said that the women who worked in the canteen were unfriendly, impolite, and rude. So you've got this problem, two groups of people not really getting on with each other. What do you do? You call in a linguist, of course. Which is what they did. They called in a guy called John Gumpers, who died last year, I think looked at this situation and he noticed that the women who worked in the canteen were, when they were interacting with the baggage handlers, they were using very low level tones. So for example, if they were giving them the food and then they, they were meaning to ask them if they wanted gravy with their food, they would just say as, as a statement, gravy, gravy, which to the English native speaker baggage handlers came across as, here's gravy, take it or leave it rather than, would you like some gravy? Gravy, thinking right back to that first example where it was clearly a question and an invitation. And they talked to the women in the uh, canteen and they, they retrained them to do this and they all, it was a happy ending, they all started to get along a little bit better. None of them, the interesting thing I think is that neither group knew why they weren't getting on, neither group could could pin it back to these, these, the intonation patterns that they were using, and yet it was making a real difference in their relationship over, over a longer term. So it can really make a difference. <coughs> so that's low level tone.
in the falls. Another thing to think about with English is the importance of the full rise. And again, Jeff has mentioned this, but the full rise contributes in a very fundamental way to politeness. So it can be very useful if we want to disagree without seeming confrontational. So here's an example. Imagine you're a parent and you say to your teenage child, please be home by eight. Please be home by eight. I want you to be home by eight o'clock. That child could reply in one of one of several ways, but there's two possibilities out there on the screen, 24 and 25. They, they, they use um, falls, and it's going to sound a little bit rude. Why? My friends stay out till 10. It's going to sound like they're answering back, like, Ugh. they're protesting, they're rebelling against the parents' um, authority and order. Replace that with a full rise, and you get a very different kind of feeling. Why? My friends stay out till 10. Seems a lot less um, confrontational to me, anyway. It sounds more polite, more pleading. And in fact, children at a very young age learn, English children, English speaking children learn the value of the full rise for getting their own way. Please, oh, very useful for, for disagreeing or asking for something that you might not get while sounding polite. So the full rise is very important. Point, as far as falling tones go, we can again make a very general division into, uh, into those which, into the, the, the division where those with uh, high falls seem to be associated with high spirits and low falls with low spirits. So, uh, yeah, so high falls do you know liveliness, general well-being, whereas low falls are more associated with lower spirits and lack of enthusiasm. And at that point, I want to play you a very short clip that is um, kind of going to illustrate this for you. I hope it's going to work in a very, in a very extreme fashion. I hope the sound is going to work. Some of which 